Welcome to another Wrench Fest here at Velo Orange headquarters. Today we are going to be putting together this rando frame set. This is going to my good friend Nick, who's doing a cross state ride of Florida. And he wanted something that was going to be very simple, very lightweight, and he wanted something that was kind of a mix of modern and classic components. So we're going to be using SRAM derailers and we're going to be using some down tube fr friction shifters. Now, why would we use down tube friction shifters in 2023? Well, the beauty of them is in their simplicity. They are the simplest way to pull cable to move a derailleur back and forth. Simpler than integrated shifters, simpler than electronic, simpler than bar ends, simpler than that, uh, that old component set that's like, you go like this in the back and then it shifts the gears. What is it? Campagnolo Cambia Corsa. Um, it's an awesome system. I love down tube shifters. I've used them on numerous bikes with, uh, for touring um, and long distance rides. They, unless something actually breaks on them where you fall and you break the lever, there's nothing to break. So they're very tried and true. You can, the other thing is that you can mix and match all sorts of components. Um, so you can use SRAM, you can use Shimano, you can use Campy, you can use whatever. As long as it pulls cable, it should work. So let's get cracking on this thing and see where it takes us. Now, before we start hanging a bunch of parts on it, let's talk about what this bike is. The Rando is our distillation of what a standard diameter thin wall tubing bike can be. I'm not going to call it a road bike because if you ride your bike on gravel, then it's a gravel bike, right? You're a gravel bike. On the road, and it's a road bike. But in any case, it takes between 700 by 23 to 35 millimeter tire. So a lot, a lot of riding conditions can be ridden on this bike. It takes side pull caliper brakes, which means that we can lighten up the whole rear triangle, lighten up the fork. Because when you add disc brake mounts on the chain stays, then you have to add additional metal, either in sizing or in thickness, which adds weight, more complexity, especially on the fork. Um, the dropouts are a design where you can both run vertical dropouts for fully geared, or you can run rear facing track dropouts. So you can run it as a fixed gear, single speed, internally geared hub, whatever 120 millimeter hub you wanted to use in that configuration. The fork is a traditional French bend the tight radius bend absorbs a lot of road chatter and actually deflects a little bit. Bottom bracket shell, standard 68 millimeters, 27 to seat post, and a inch and an eighth head tube. So here's what I'm talking about with the dropouts. You can run a vertical dropout for 130 millimeter spaced rear wheels, or you can run a rear facing dropout for 120 millimeter spaced hub. So that's your fixed gears, that's your single speeds. So let me know in the comments what you're running. For this one, we're gonna use a vertical. So now we're going to install the dropouts. They basically use a chain ring bolt. So six millimeter on the inside, five millimeter on the outside. Oh man, it's a high gravity day today. And repeat on the other side. Let's take a look at some of the components we're gonna be hanging on the bike. Now, I will say that I have already built this bike basically for myself at some point. So I actually have a lot of the stuff that came off that bike that we can reuse. They're perfectly good. Like drilling crank set with the nice crank caps. All these have kind of been cleaned up already. Side pull brakes, Nuvo Rando bars with tape. And these have the Drillium 
Um, I think those are TRP, RRL brake levers. They're pretty comfortable. I like those. Down tube shifters with Rustine's shifter covers. Very rare at this point. Square taper bottom bracket, headset, and some SRAM rival front and rear derailleurs. And we also have wheels with some nice and supple ultra dynamico 33 millimeter tires with the velo orange hub and look at that valve stem matches let's get the fork out so we can press the headset in come on lots of grease on the head tube and on the cups Now, something you've probably noticed at this point is that I never face and chase our frames. That's because I don't feel like they need it. I face and ch chase frames from other companies in my past, as well as vintage ones where I felt that they needed it. Basically, what that does is you're, when you face it, you're basically removing this uppermost layer of paint and metal so that the bearings sit parallel to each other. Because if they're askew, you're going to have binding and you're going to have um, basically their bearings are going to be compromised in a much shorter period of time. And then the chasing part is on the head tube, you basically remount a little bit of the inside where the cup sits so that it sits square inside so it's not ovalized there's not too much metal where the cup gets damaged but i never had to do it i've never taken one out of the box and and said oh wow i really need to do this to this frame all right headset cups in i just realized that was upside down i know what i'm doing i definitely know what i'm doing anyway it went in Now we're going to put the lower crown race on. Just snaps right into place. Easy peasy. Put a little bit of grease where the bearings sit. Assembly goes. Where's the headset stuff? Oh, found my fingers. Get the spacers over here. Goes. Bearing. On the fork crown, fork in, bearing, seated, split, compression, washer, thin, shim, upper bearing cover. Slide that guy all the way down. Woo. Now, since Nick and I are roughly the same height, I know where I like to put my stem and so he can always he can always cut it down later if he wants to it's a lot easier take note everyone it's a lot easier to lower your stem than it is to put your steer stack back on so you can use a felt tip marker I kind of like to use this scribe it's a very pointy end right here and basically what you're going to do just go like this and you're basically scratching scratching a mark here i find that this is a little bit more accurate than than using a marker because you kind of have like the, the plastic end of the marker that you need to deal with steer tube cutter going in find our mark There's a little window right here that you can see where the mark is. Okay, let's make sure this is in the right spot. Perfect. Now, if you had any uh, anger you wanted to get out, now's the time. All right, fork out. Let's 
clean it off. Now you're going to have a bunch of shavings and all sorts of like kind of rough stuff. So let's clean that off. Don't need much. Basically, let's wipe off the excess shavings here. And then it's like a flat file. Clean it. Basically, what you're doing is deburring it, make sure it's all smooth. And I have a round file for the inside. All right, much better. Let's get the fork back in. Then we can start hanging some fun parts on it. Tapered brass spacer, regular spacer, regular spacer. Stem, top cap, I pressed in the, uh, the star fangle off camera, it's in there, ooh, you know what, let me take this off, let me show you how much sear needs to be inside the stem, because if you don't have enough, it's not going to preload correctly. That is how much steer you should have inside of your stem. Just like, you know, maybe a millimeter, maybe two underneath of the top edge of the stem. And that's so that you can preload the bearings properly. Top cap doesn't need a whole lot of preload, just a little bit to keep it in place. Tighten at the stem. All right, for gearing, the rear cassette is going to be an 11, 32, 11 speed. Usually I try to gear people lower, but I know that Nick is a strong rider. And in case you didn't know, Florida is pretty, pretty flat. So 11, 32 is a nice range. Okay, lock ring on. And we're gonna need a big wrench. Tight, tight, tight. All right, let's get this on. Rear wheel going in. I put a little bit of grease on the skewer. Spring, narrow side in. Not. Rear wheel in. Rear brake going on. Recess nut in the back. Now, if you notice, it goes brake assembly and then serrated washer and then recess nut in the back. All right, as I'm tightening this guy down, let's close this, is that I'm generally getting the pad centered on the rim. So if I just did this, the whole thing would move. So I'm holding it with counter pressure on the drive side so that stays put. So that the distance from the rim to the brake pad is the same on the non-drive side as it is on the drive side. All right, brake is good and tight. Need to make some adjustments there. So the brake pad is basically hitting too low on the rim. So we're gonna undo this guy. We're gonna raise it up just a little bit. And we'll do the final, um, we'll do the final adjustment when we get the uh, brakes hooked up. Do the same thing on the other side. Front wheel going in. Man, I just really love a good rim brake, side caliper, side pull caliper bike. Just so simple. It's easy. I do love disc brakes though too. Don't get me wrong. All right, let's get the front brake on. 
just like the back and tighten it down making sure it's generally centered these brakes have a little grub screw on the side so you can do very very fine-tuned adjustments to get it just perfectly centered all right cool front brake officially on square taper bottom bracket going in grease and then grease on the drive side as well then i also put a little bit of grease on the cup i like to put the non-drive side cup in first it's just easier to do this not all the way in it's just so that there's like a little bit of alignment so that when you put the drive side cup in the the kind of internal the, the seal is kind of keeping it aligned so you don't have to worry about cross threading the shell tighten this guy down just a little bit just a little bit not too far in all right that's good for now now the drive side is tightening counterclockwise at least on English threaded bottom brackets. Other bottom brackets like French threaded are actually regular righty tighty lefty loosey on both sides, which if you ever worked on a French bike, the drive side, I'm sorry, if you ever worked on a French bike, the non drive side always comes loose. All right, drive side is tight and we're going to tighten down the non drive side. Now let's get it ready for a crank. Now I see, I can already hear your keyboards clacking away. Oh my God, he put grease on the taper. You're not supposed to do that. Well, yes, you can do it either way. It doesn't really matter. I've always done it this way and it's worked for me. You can do it. You don't have to do it. I'm not your mom. Now bottom bracket spindle lengths are determined by the crank. So with our Derillium and our 50.4, we the crank set asks for a 118 millimeter bottom bracket. Other ones might use, I don't know, 103. Other ones may use something else, maybe 110. Like our single ring uh, crank set uses a 110 for proper chain line. Um, other one, the mountain crank sets use different spindle lengths. So. When in doubt, ask the manufacturer. And if you can't ask the manufacturer because they're not around anymore or they don't answer the telephone, then you can, there's a, there's a website that's called VeloBase, which has pretty much, I haven't found a crank set that isn't on there. So oftentimes you'll find it on there. It'll say what spindle length as well as the taper that it needs. All right, so crank arms on. Let's get these cool dust covers on. Now these are brass crank caps from our friends over at Blue Lug in Japan. Um, the, they also make the brass spacers. And what I really like about these is that they also work as extractors. So you just have a little pin tool, tighten it down. So if you need to take the crank off, you don't need a special crank tool to take them off our our cranks come with extractors also similarly to this but they are silver and so if you want a little bit of contrasting color there you go these are really nice you can find them on our web store same thing for the drives for the non-drive side oh and if you need to pick up a pin spanner for this project and probably other projects you might have around the house this is park tool spa6 that's spa6 I actually don't know if they still make this anymore, to be honest with you. Rear derailleur going on. Let go. Front derailleur going on. So it needs a little clamp because it the front derailleur is sized for a I think a 31.8 seat tube. So we just need to reduce it down to 28.6. Looks about right. We'll do the minor adjustments. Now I'm looking at it from the top, making sure that it's 
straight. Looks good to me. The nice thing with friction is that you can always make little tiny adjustments and it doesn't affect it a whole lot. Okay, front derailleur on, chain going on. I am using a Shimano 11 speed chain. Don't tell SRAM. Actually, don't tell Shimano either. I don't want to get in trouble. Around the cassette, through the cage, around the jockey wheel, around the lower jockey wheel. Let's size it. Now, I'm in small, small right now, so we need to take out, let's see, two pairs of links. Quick links going in. I take it off the front chain ring so it's a little bit easier so you're not fighting the tension of the derailleur. So now we got to set the quick link. Run it through until it's at the top. All right, now we're going to take the bike down. Per Shimano's infinite wisdom, once you have the link set in that position, you just push on the cranks. That's it. Let's get the shifters on. Now, these are not part of the frame. These are purely just rubber plugs that they use to cover the shifter boss during painting and transport. So we have people sometimes say, Oh, these fell off. I need, I, these looked so damaged, but no, these need to come off. Take them off, throw them away. A little bit of grease. All right. Now this is important. So listen up. The correct orientation is like this. These have several different shims and stuff like that spacers. So like that with the tab pointing, uh, kind of up the down tube. Then you have a brass spacer here. Okay. And then you have the shifter. Now this is keyed. It's kind of hard to see, but these are keyed. You match the key up. Sometimes it'll fall off and you just put it right back on. Then you have this guy black plastic cap or a compression washer. Then you have the silver cap and then you have the screw, the thumb screw. So kind of keep that whole assembly there while you tighten this guy down. Now you don't, you shouldn't need to like really reef on this moderate tension on it. That's all you need. All right. Drive side done. Now what this shifter is, is the, Diacomp 11 speed version. Notice it has a bigger barrel than the regular version. And basically for every little movement here, you actually pull a little bit more cable. I found that it's a little bit more comfortable um, to use with 11 speed drive trains, 10 speed road and under use the regular size, 11 speed road and 10 speed Dynasys use the bigger size, just like the drive side. Rubber cap off, keyed washer, brass washer, shifter goes like this. Okay, there you are. And now these are also have a little bit of a key to it as well. So make sure that the rectangles line up together and you'll see it'll, it'll sit flush when you start screwing it in. All right. Done. Non-drive side, done. Okay, let's get the rear brake routed. Now, like I said, since I've kind of already built this bike in a different, slightly different permutation, um, all the cables and housing are already cut to length. So goes in that stop. Couldn't find this little bit of rear housing, but that's okay. We'll just measure it. You want a nice graceful arc from there, from the brake to the cable stop right here. Let's cut it. I was in cap in and in the frame. Perfect. Now cable going through. 
snug it through the pinch bolt, pull it tight, grasp it with your left hand, and compress the brake, and tighten down the pinch bolt. Okay. Now, we need to adjust the brake, because what's happening is the non-drive side is not touching, but the drive side is just barely touching. So we're going to use this screw, this screw, to do some light adjustments. Psych, I'm actually going to loosen the screw in the back and readjust it that way. Just so I get baseline, then we'll use the little grub screw. There we go. That's better. And here's a quick trick you can do to adjust the brakes, to adjust uh, side pull caliper brakes. Take your hand, align where you want the pad to be, squeeze the brake, and now you just use a wrench and tighten it down. The friction of the pad against the rim is actually holding it in place so that it is lined up just how I want it to be so it isn't turning or anything. And you basically do the same on the other side. And for the final turn, you just kind of hold it and you're basically doing counter pressure against the brake shoe and tightening it down. So now that one is hitting exactly in the middle of the rim. All right, so right now the non-drive side is hitting before the, and you can actually see the wheel moving a little bit. Um, the non-drive side is hitting before the drive side. So we take a 2.5, 2.5, no, two millimeter. And so turning it clockwise will increase the tension and bring the brake towards the drive side. Decreasing the tension will bring it towards the non-drive side. Let's see, much better. Just a little bit, tiny tunes. That's it, brake's all set up. Snip the cable. Cable crimp on. All right, rear brake done. And copy and paste on the front. Cable going in. Boop. Goes underneath the bottom bracket shell through the little guide here. Pull it through, through the housing. The back side of the trailer. Where do you need to go? There's a little guide here. Okay. Get in there. There we are. Okay. Pull it taut. And that's it. Let's see how it shifts. Look at that. Perfectly. Just like the rear cable going in the front, around the bottom bracket, through behind the bottom bracket shell, up, 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 through the little guide here, full tension, and tighten down. Now let's see. Oh, get out of here. All right. That's it. You're cut off. Okay. Now, let's see how we did. Oh, too far. I did make a grave error. I had forgotten that this one has something very special. This one has yaw, which means that basically instead of the front derailleur just simply moving in and out, this one moves at an angle. 
So it goes like this. That's supposed to have better shifting, but I have to readjust the, uh, the limit screws and stuff. So I'll do that right now. So this is the, uh, the yaw thing. So basically it goes like this. As it, as it shifts, it goes like that. All right, let's check our work. Much better. All right, let's get some water bottle cages on this guy. We're going to use a, a favorite of mine, the Modern East. We're going to, uh, uh oh, is this a disaster? Yes, but also no. Um, basically, the clamp is interfering with the clearance between the back of the cage and the mounts. So there is a very easy solution. Presta valve washers. They're the perfect size. I think one will do the trick. There's one. And two. Look at that. No problem. You can see that there is just enough clearance between the back of the cage and the front derailleur that it's not interfering. And copy and paste minus the Presto washers on the down tube. I like the Modern Ace bottle cages because not only does it fit the regular plastic water bottles, but also the uh, full metal bivos. So now we're going to install the saddle onto the seat post. Unscrew the screw that is securing everything together. Now when the parts come apart, you're going to have these two tubes. You can put them in the parts bin. You don't need them for the seat post installation. Flip the saddle over onto the bench. This is the process that I found is the easiest. Grease on the screw. And put the lower clamp on, generally in the middle. Now where I just pointed, that's the drive side. So you're going to have the piece that is recessed on that side. Slip it under. Same thing on the non-drive side. And insert the head of the seat post into that assembly. Put the screw through the entire assembly. Give it a couple turns, and it'll start threading in. If you feel any resistance, don't continue. You don't want to cross-thread anything. And if you feel like it's getting a little tight, then you can always take the assembly apart and put the screw through the backside of the receiver to potentially clean up any threads. And now the seat post and saddle are ready to be installed on the bike. That carcass of a seat post is what we use to clamp in the bike stand so we don't damage or scuff or anything like that the seat post we're actually going to be using. Generously grease the seat post as well as the seat tube. Insert the seat post into the seat tube. That screw at the top allows adjustment of the fore and aft position as well as the tilt of the saddle. So once you get it in a good spot, go ahead and use a five millimeter and snug it down. And would you look at that? We have a fully built bike. Now is the best part, the test ride. Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe and happy riding out there.